Hello, everyone. I'm Kristen Collier. I would like to thank Notre Dame's McGrath Institute for Church Life for asking me to spend a few minutes talking to you today. I'm a medical doctor, the mother of four boys, and a pro-life feminist. I'm thrilled to be sharing with you five things you need to know about fetal development in pregnancy. As you may have noticed on the opening slide, the sketch I included had two people pictured, both a baby and a mama. Why, you might ask, would I have a picture of a baby and a mama, and not just the baby, especially when the majority of things I'll be talking about today um, are just about the baby? Well, the simple answer is that we really can't and shouldn't think about one without the other. So often in the abortion discourse, the pro-lifers have so much focus on the baby, that sometimes the mother is the more hidden person in the background. And the converse is also true. Then the pro-choice community, there's so much focus on the woman that the baby and her moral status is often really nowhere to be found. And as I will hopefully show you, when we talk about development, we really can't talk about the baby without the mother. So what are the five things we need to know? So number one, the prenatal child, even from the very beginning, is not just a clump of cells, but a living, growing human being with organs and functions really just like ours. Two, Human development doesn't happen in a bubble, even though it may look like it, right? The baby's floating in this um, amniotic fluid in the sac, but actually her developments are greatly influenced by her mother's physical, social, and mental health, and really reflects a beautiful dependency. Three, the prenatal child and her mother are connected through a shared organ, the placenta, which is the only organ in humans that is made and shared by two persons. Four, the benefits of pregnancy to the mother are many and in part are mediated through an amazing process known as fetal maternal microchimerism. And five, pregnancy is a cooperative venture that reflects a radical mutuality between two persons. You've probably heard the phrase clump of cells used when describing the early stages of the prenatal child's life. Every dehumanizing ideology succumbs to the same temptation to see the undesirable other as a non-person and thus disposable. In this distorted light, the disposal of the unwanted person becomes not only morally permissible, but meritorious, a praiseworthy act. The dehumanizing language used in abortion discourse is not unique to abortion, of course. We hear similar dehumanizing language used for people with disabilities, the elderly, refugees, and other populations. Language is a powerful tool which can be wielded to shape society's views in ways that we take for granted or may overlook. But what is trying to be conveyed with the phrase cluster of cells or clump of cells? Perhaps one envisions an inert, potential, meaningly undignified glob of DNA. This cluster of cells is either that or something with immense potential meaning and sacredness, because of course the prenatal child isn't and can't be both. But like every worthy attempt at getting one to believe something that isn't true, using a half-truth or familiar term that we recognize like cells, right? helps us to hook on, agree it sounds right, and then just move on with our day. And to complicate matters further, there are many types of cells, malignant cells, dead cells, mutated cells, and many types of things are made up of cells, right? Pigs, vegetables, tumors. What type of cell is one hoping comes to mind when one uses the phrase clump of cells? Human beings, yes, are made up of cells, but are we cells? Are we just primarily cells or are we so much more than that? If these questions didn't get at some big fundamental truth, we wouldn't see the emotion and discourse that has ensued and everybody would have already moved on. There's a collective sense that getting this right has some type of immense significance. Something important is at stake. So the big question is, when does life begin? You know, and it really depends who you ask. There are multiple different opinions on this. But I thought this excerpt from an embryology textbook was interesting that really says that human beings start, their beginning is at fertilization. This one also says the same thing. This is important, why? Because if the science books state this, then abortion clearly puts an end to the life of a human being, not just an end to some clump of cells, but a human being, a member of the human family. Okay, so what happens after fertilization? So let's start by talking about the formation of the heart, or as we call it in medicine, cardiogenesis. The heart is the first functional organ to develop. It starts more of a, as a tubular structure before um, it develops the walls and the, and the chambers, which are like the spaces, um, to look like our hearts, which are four chambered in a healthy state. Um, the heart begins, uh, begins beating around 21 days after fertilization, um, and really can be that heartbeat can be detected by usually a transvaginal ultrasound around shortly after that time, with the heart structurally being pretty much fully formed mostly by the 10th week. 
So last year, there again was a debate uh, using nomenclature and language regarding the fetal heart bills um, when um, there were some legislature considered um, around uh, limiting abortion um, after a detectable heartbeat. This opinion piece by pro-choice gynecologist Dr. Jen Gunter said that we should resist calling these bills heartbeat bills, but instead call them, quote, fetal pole cardiac activity bills, end quote. Again, another attempt, right, using language to distance the prenatal child's humanity from you or me as if they really aren't the same as us. But this isn't some abstract, odd process, right? The fetal heart is four-chambered, just like yours and mine. This sketch um, represents what the heart looks like structurally with its four chambers right around day 30, actually. So what about the brain? So as early as seven weeks, there's a brain structure um, and there's a three parts already, the front brain, the midbrain, and the hindbrain. First trimester, just a lot of growth with neurons and synapses and spinal cords developing. In the second trimester, the brain has taken over some big functions. And third trimester, you start to get the um, division into the hemispheres and just rapid, rapid growth. So what else is going on? So by eight weeks, pretty much all the major organs are nearly formed. By 16 weeks, the baby's blinking and has her distinct fingerprints. And at 20 weeks, she can make faces, she can suck her thumb, she is yawning and stretching. So you may think because the prenatal child is in what appears to be a closed system in the amniotic fluid that her development just happens in a very autonomous, independent way, closed off from the world. But actually she's very impacted by outside influences. The baby's very dependent on her mother for her nutrition, which she gets across the placenta and delivered to her through the umbilical cord. And also the baby's temperature, for example, is totally maternally dependent. This thermal regulation, as we call it, is also regulated through and done through the placenta. In recent decades, researchers have found also that the larger environment around the baby um, is also very important. Um, some effects are obvious, right, with the mother's physical health, for example, smoking and drinking. If the mom smokes and drinks, um, that can be devastating to the baby. Other social factors influence the baby. So, for example, studies have found that people who were born during the Dutch famine of 1944, most of them had starving mothers, were more likely to have health problems like obesity and diabetes later in life. Did you know that the baby's development is also intimately linked with her mental health of her mother? So the baby actually gets chemical signals through the placenta that includes signals about the mother's mental state. So for example, if the mother's depressed, that affects how the baby develops after she's born. Depression during pregnancy can also lead to miscarriage, delivering the baby early, which is called preterm labor, or having um, a baby that's small with sort of a lower birth rate weight. In fact, Women who experience high levels of just general stress during pregnancy have a significantly higher risk for preterm delivery, even after accounting for the other effects of other established risk factors for preterm delivery compared to women with low levels of stress. So this can include things like, um, you know, housing insecurity, if the mother's homeless or is in an unsupportive relationship, all these factors can influence the growth and development of the baby. Research has also demonstrated that a mother and her child are so connected that the mother's voice actually can directly affect the development of her child's brain. Most of us are familiar with research that shows that babies can not only recognize their mother's voice in utero and prefers that other over all other voices, but research has also shown that the mother's voice has the ability to affect her child's brain structure. In one study done at the Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston on premature babies, mother's voices were recorded singing and reading, and these recordings were played for their babies for hours a day into the intervention group of babies into their incubator, while the other group of babies, the control group, received just standard care and didn't hear their mom's voices. Babies who were exposed to their mother's voices had significantly thicker auditory cortices than those in the control group, so part of their brain actually was a different size. We are just beginning to understand the physiological and biochemical bond between mom and baby. But the idea that we affect and we can affect the size of our children's brains by our voices through singing and speaking to them points to the beauty of how we all need and benefit from one another in a way that complements the underlying biology and speaks to a wondrous design that works best in a way that is relational. So how else is the baby and mom relationship a mutual one? From the beginning, the prenatal child is in cooperation with her mother and building something that can only be described as amazing, really the human placenta depicted here in what's called a placenta print. The placenta is the most 
um, beautiful organ. It's the only purposely transient organ in humans. And it's the only organ that is created by two people in cooperation as it's made in part by part of tissue from mom and part of the tissue from baby. And so therefore the organ is actually referred to as a fetal maternal organ. The creation of the placenta is the first opportunity for a baby and mother to join together in a common purpose. It is the organ through which the mother and baby interface as we stated earlier. And it's incredible because really it serves as many organs, just one. It essentially functions for the baby as the baby's kidneys and lungs, um, and also has immune and endocrine function as well. Historically, the placenta has been called the afterbirth as it is delivered after the baby and has long been considered nothing more than really an afterthought. This, however, is changing. As part of the Eunice Kennedy Shriver Institute of Child Health and Human Development, um, at the NIH, which is a branch of the NIH. The um, NIH has this HPP, which is the Human Placenta Project, with a goal of better understanding this important organ to date. This has granted more than $50 million in research funding to um, people who are trying to understand this important organ and how having a healthy placenta is important for healthy babies and adults, actually. And as the NIH website says here, Quote, the placenta is arguably one of the most important organs in the body, which is an incredibly amazing achievement for a, quote, cluster of cells to have been apart. Lastly, we are brought to our final fun fact about pregnancy, the subject of fetal maternal microchimerism. So the chimera, as many of you know in Greek mythology, is the fire-breathing creature that is made of three distinct creatures in one, the lion's head, the goat's body, and the serpent's tail. In science, Microchimerism is the presence of a small population of genetically distinct and separately derived cells within an individual. The connection between mother and baby is intimate and more profound than previously believed. The growing baby sends some of her cells across the placenta into her mother in a way that we're just beginning to understand. These cells then integrate into the tissues in which they lodge and start functioning like the cells surrounding them. So this presence of fetal cells in maternal tissue is known as fetal maternal microchimerism. So these microchimeric fetal cells have been found in various maternal tissues and organs such as the breast, the bone marrow, the skin, the liver, and the brain. Early and late effects of these cells have been hypothesized. Some of these cells appear to target sites of injury and may help mother heal after delivery by integrating into the cesarean suction wound, for example, and helping to um, produce collagen. Others have been thought to help protect a mother against breast cancer later in life and they even may affect how soon the mother can get pregnant again. Researchers are just beginning to understand the functions of these cells, but some models suggest that some of these cells continue to aid the mother years after her baby is born. And there's increasing evidence that fetal maternal microchimerism persists lifelong in many childbearing women, and really may have important implications for the immune status of women. The full significance of fetal maternal microchimerism remains unclear, and in some studies, the cells have been linked to some higher rates of disease. But this reality challenges our long-standing ideas about human beings existing as singular, autonomous individuals, and this presence is bidirectional. What we do know, what this means really, is that most human beings carry remnants of other people in their bodies and shows that many of us are interconnected even down to the level of the cell, and that mothers, babies, let's do the slide again, what this means is that, sorry. What this means is that most humans carry remnants of other humans in their bodies and shows that many of us are interconnected even down to the level of our cells. And also what this shows is that mom's bodies are forever changed by pregnancy because their baby cells are in their bodies oftentimes for the rest of their lives. For women who do have abortions, we need to think about the numbers on the consequences um, of which we can be sure. So this is a study that looked at 1990 to 2019. However, let's even think about more recently from 2015 to 2019. So what we do know is during that time, um, roughly 121 million unintended pregnancies happened across the globe. And of these unintended pregnancies, 61% ended in abortion. This translates to about 73 million abortions per year. For women who have abortions, what are the outcomes? Well, as we've seen above, abortion for one of the parties involved results in the ending of their life in a most violent way. For many women, we know that abortion is an, uh, is an unchoice 
Um, we know that because of coercion or threat of violence or because we do not have the social structures, policies and support for women oftentimes to be able to choose to keep their babies, that really is on cho choice. Um, for women who do have abortion, we know oftentimes from uh, literature and from discussing with, with women that, that regret is often very real. From our best data, we can know probably four things. One, abortion is consistently associated. So note I said associated and not using words that apply direct causality with elevated rates of mental illness compared to women without a history of abortion. Number two, the abortion experience directly contributes likely to mental health problems for at least some women. Three, there are risk factors such as pre-existing mental illness that identify women at greater risk um, for developing mental health problems after an abortion. And number four, it is impossible to conduct research really in this field in a manner that can definitively identify the extent to which any mental illnesses following abortion can be reliably attributed to abortion in and of itself. We know that in the abortion discourse, the word freedom and the word liberation are often used. So, so for example, for women to be free and liberated, we must have you know, unfettered access to abortion, which is the narrative that's been pushed. But if we're honest with ourselves as to what abortion truly is, we come to the realization that liberation that costs innocent lives is merely just oppression redistributed. And this is not liberation, true liberation. Hopefully I've given you a window into the wonderful complexity of our prenatal brothers and sisters. And this helps you when you're thinking about the reality of what abortion really is. Besides for us to see the prenatal child in all her complexity and meaning, her dignity becomes much more difficult to ignore and her life that much harder to dishonor. Thank you.